Give you a moment there to digest that in. So over the next nine weeks, my objective is to tackle some of the most intriguing and really hotly debated prophecy chapters in all of the Bible. In all of these, the spiritual world is involved. Ethan? All right, man. Good to see you, man. I didn't know school was done. So we're going to hear a lot about angels, archangels, Satan. Uh, his angels, the Antichrist, and you name it on the spiritual world, uh, you're going to get a little bit of it. As you can see in the title, is that my other goal here is to give Matt a break, a do break. And hopefully this calendar is the one that we will stick to throughout uh, the next few Sundays all the way until the first one in June. Now, the only thing, and I really do hope the only thing that could kind of blow up this calendar uh, is this little guy. Uh, who we kind of had some wonderings if, you know, is he coming earlier than suspected? Uh, for a while there, we were thinking it might be a five weeks more ahead of, uh, but the, still the plan is, oh boy. Ahead of the end of June is when um, our, our, hopefully our next uh, and last son uh, is, <laughs> is due. Uh, but as you can see, is that we're going to hit Daniel's uh, main eschatological prophecy chapters and then pick back up into Revelation 12 through 14. And you can easily see here is that uh, 12, um, Daniel's 2, 7, 10 through 12 visions uh, feed into uh, 12, 13, and 14 in Revelation quite a bit. A number of weeks ago is that I covered John's vision of the risen Lord in chapter 1. There we saw that John's descriptions of Jesus were stemmed off of descriptions found in the Old Testament, especially in Daniel. Then, in chapters 4 and 5, is that I briefly highlighted uh, the numerous Old Testament references uh, when we're talking about John's vision and entering into the throne room scene. And there, too, we saw Daniel showing up over and over again. And overall, in the book of Revelation, is that you find Daniel just all over the place, uh, especially with chapter 7's vision of the four beasts and the Son of Man figure that we covered quite a bit in the first go around, but also chapter 2's, or excuse me, with the divine figures that are both equated with uh, Yahweh. Uh, but not just chapter 7 is important to understand in interpret, interpreting Revelation better, but also chapter 2's story of Daniel interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the statue of multiple metals. And also, uh, probably sometimes overlooked, is Daniel's final vision in chapters 10 through 12. We saw a little of this with Daniel 12's description of the general resurrection uh, that we covered a little bit. That connects perfectly with Revelation 20's resur resurrection of the dead scene. The other neat feature with the Daniel backdrop is that in this approach is that Daniel 12 through 14 uh, does serve as an interlude between the seven trumpets and the seven bull judge judgment trumpet or seven bull judgments, uh, and so in a similar way is that's kind of what I'm doing for Matt here. I'm just kind of serving a break in between uh, these uh, three septets. So let's get into today's lesson by answering two really important questions: Who are the four empires in chapter two, Daniel two, and what is the kingdom of God? Daniel 2.1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep broke from him. A quick passing point here is that it's said that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed multiple dreams, or really that this is a reoccurring dream that just has gone on for so long with him that he just can no longer take it, and he doesn't even want to sleep any anymore because of it. This gives us the reason why in verse 2 he does the following. Then the king commanded to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans for them to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. So Nebuchadnezzar's call for all of the help to resolve this issue is because 
Well, that was their job, was that when the king had certain dreams, it was, hey, he calls them in, and they're supposed to interpret what, what's its meaning. These guys were so-called professionals and experts at their given fields, and verse 3 shares how much Nebuchadnezzar was freaking out by his repeated dream and expecting them to do the task. It's not coincidental that uh, numerous archaeological findings have been unearthed that show that Babylonians had volumes of this written down on how to interpret dreams. They saw dreams as supernatural communication from the gods that they worshipped. So over the course of time with all this is that they started to develop basically uh, dream interpretation manuals to, to go off of. Verse 4. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Syriac, or Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. You can see here that they want or really need Nebuchadnezzar to tell them what the dream is so that then they can go check their guidebook on what to tell him. Nebuchadnezzar says no and calls them out for not being able to just straight out tell him what his dream was because, you know, they're the ones who have this, you know, supernatural insight with the gods. So he says, basically, off with your heads, and he sends forth a decree that all the wise men should be slain, including Daniel and his fellow friends as well. Now, before moving on, is that I want to highlight one import, important interpretation point uh, in Daniel, is that in verse 4, it said that the Chaldeans began to speak in Aramaic. Why that is important is because chapter 2 is actually a transition point in the book of Daniel from Hebrew into Aramaic. This continues on all the way through chapter 7, and then when you get to chapter 8, it reverts back into Hebrew. Why that is important is because it, there's a lot of proposals out there of like, you know, why would he do such a thing? And basically, there's no explicit answer within Daniel. Um, some will say, hey, this is Gentile focus, and it switches back to Hebrew. Um, there's a lot of different ways to look at it, but there's nothing explicit in it. Textually, though, chapter 2 through 7's Aramaic, Aramaic section is written in a chiastic structure. And what I mean by that in, is that the easiest way to demonstrate it, or easiest way to explain it is by demonstrating it. These six Aramaic chapters have six points that start with uh, a point A, and then it moves forward into a point B, then into point C, then it starts to work itself back out with C prime, B prime, and then A prime. And so it kind of for, forms a going in and a going out. Uh, grammarians will say that the main point of a chiasm is its furthest point out, um, or the tip of, of it, if you will. But for our purposes here is that chapter 2 through 7 layout uh, does the following. How this helps us to interpret the prophecies is that this structure makes chapters 2 and 7 correspond to one another. Then you would see that chapters two or 3 and 6 go together, and then chapters 4 and 5 do the same as well. So when you look at the main themes in each of these chapters, is that what does it tell you about chapters 2 and 7 when looking at them? What's that? Different? Different? Is that they would be actually equal to each other. And so we're, we'll get into that, and there's actually, and Nate brings up something, is that there is uh, different views about, you know, who the empires are, and we're going to be diving into, you know, chapter 2, and then we'll get into uh, 7 next week about it. Now, I'm going to say that they are one and the same, and we'll, we'll chug through it, and we'll see uh, why I land at that position. Now, some of you might think, okay, yeah, I already kind of with you, but uh, next week we'll actually show a very popular TV uh, program that goes kind of uh, pretty far with the beast, I would say, uh, and then you probably will end up shaking your head at, like, how does this guy get away with this? Um, moving ahead, though, to verse 18, is that uh, Daniel 2 requested time to pray to God that he might have God reveal the dream to him. The key word here, though, is secret, 
because when the word is translated into Greek is that the Septuagint translators, uh, the Jews that translated uh, the Old Testament into Greek, is that they use the word mysterion. And does anybody remember why does this sound familiar from recent Revelation studies? The mystery of God in chapter 10. And so there we saw that with the blowing of the seventh trumpet that the mystery of God is going to be completed. Christ referred to the kingdom of God as a mystery and that that mystery was revealed to the disciples, but to everyone who else was rejecting him, he, he was in parable form, so that it was still veiled and confused. Uh, if you read through the rest of the New Testament, you're going to see Paul you know, bring up a lot about you know, the mystery of the church, the mystery of iniquity. There's, you know, some will say that he has seven mysteries, um, including uh, glorified bodies is a mystery in 1 Corinthians 15 when, uh, when we receive our bodies that are like Christ. Um, and yes, you know, but with, with these mysteries is that with the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God is that some teachers will actually try to say that there's a distinction here between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And when you look at the, these three synoptic verses is that they're all dealing with the same scene. Uh, Matthew uses heaven, uh, Luke and Mark use God. And the question here is, is there a distinction between these two, or are they one and the same? One and the same. Matthew 19, 23 through 24 uh, kind of undermines the view that tries to make a distinction between this because Jesus flat out uses the two interchangeably within the same paragraph. And it's not that, you know, this is such a, a huge point to just drill down on. Uh, it's just dependent upon, you know, kind of, what prophecy teacher you might pick up on a given day. Uh, Matthew, just for knowledge sake, is the only one who uses the phrase kingdom of heaven. Uh, Luke and Mark do not, neither does John, and some teachers will take that and say, okay, I'm gonna run hard with this. Uh, do they bring up this within their uh, commentary? No, they're not going to, because then it just kind of, well, that undermines everything that I just wrote for 300 pages on it. So, and it doesn't sell a book. So, um, moving ahead, Daniel 2.19. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king had demanded the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot be revealed by them unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and will make known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed, what should come to pass hereafter. And God, who revealed the secret, will make you know what shall come to pass. As shown earlier is that these verses get used at the beginning and end of Revelation by John. And we're going to come back to this because we're going to see the significance of it in interpretation. Verse 31. Thou, O king, saw and beheld a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, and his feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You saw that statue standing until a stone that was cut out without hands smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them into pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Now, just looking at this verse real quick, and not super big point or anything, but did you see uh, the we in this? Who's the we? his other three buddies, right? Daniel went back and prayed with him. Sometimes it's just one of those little overlooked details in the book. 
Verse 37. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. And whosoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, he hath given into your hand and has made you ruler all over all of them. You are this head of gold. Notice how simple Daniel told us, you know, that the statute is representing rulers and kingdoms and that the gold is flat out who? Babylon. Babylon. There shouldn't be really any debate on this, but again, sometimes people just want to veer off for their own uh, agenda and purposes. Verse 39. And after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaks all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas you saw the feet and the toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of iron. The first thing to notice here is that this tells us that there's not a fifth empire and that the toes or the feet and toes that are partly of iron and partly of clay are still associated with the fourth empire. Another thing is that the fourth empire is going to get the most attention in chapter two and we'll see actually in seven as well. And with that, we're going to get uh, some extra details that are very <laughs> sorry specific about this empire that we can historically track on. The first one is that we can note is that this empire is said to get divided at some point in history. And the second is that the strength or might of the empire will remain in them even after the division takes place. So uh, the other thing here is that with clay is that when you think about clay and you compare it to say metals is that it's what compared to it? It's weaker, it's soft, um, and, but also that it's sticky in nature. And so it's kind of when they were building statutes is that they would use clay as a filler, you know, and kind of hold it together. But with that is that can it then last forever? No, it's very weak, it's brittle, and eventually it's going to crumble and, you know, like clay, it can dry up and uh, just smash upon itself. Continuing in verse 30, or 41. In the feet and toes, forasmuch as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Again, we know that the feet and toes are part of the fourth empire because of verse 40. It's still within it. The next detail about the fourth empire is that with the feet being described as partly strong and partly broken. Verse 43. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they, notice the plural there, shall mingle themselves with the seed of man, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with miry clay. This makes a lot of sense since clay and iron are, you know, not ultimately going to hold together like we referenced earlier. And thus it cannot last forever as in these days, uh, in the days of these kings, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Now, there's a lot to unpack there, but let's just go to the final uh, interpretation verse of Daniel. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. So going back to verse 44 with the uncut stone destroying all the prior kingdoms is that we have five descriptions about the coming kingdom. First is that it's God himself who is going to set up this kingdom. So it's God's kingdom, i.e. the kingdom of God. Next is that it shall never be destroyed. 
third is that God himself is going to rule this kingdom. This is implied with a description that, you know, it's an uncut stone made without hands. It's not created, and the only thing that's not created is God. Fourth is that this kingdom will conquer and or annihilate all the prior ones from the earth. There won't be a single trace of them left. So, you know, at the day when there's, you know, the city uh, council meeting, it's going to flow through him still. And fifth is that it's an everlasting kingdom and it's going to stand for eternity. So, on our diagram, uh, is that God's kingdom is the end point of history and as we are thinking of it now, is that we understand that it comes after the fourth empire. If you're taking notes on all of this, is that there's four common elements to kind of take note of with the, with the empires themselves. And they're going to seem pretty dub, but the first is that they are uh, governments or ruling entities. Is it coming up here? Did I hit a stopping point? I don't know why they didn't show up, but um, so the four points is that they are a government, they're earthly, uh, they're ruled by Gentiles, and if you look at the, uh, them specifically is that, you know, it's very Jerusalem focused, and they have some form of uh, rulership over uh, Babylon at some point, and that uh, they are conquered kingdoms, and by conquering the previous one uh, to them. Uh, the tag on here is that with that is that then God's kingdom will also be one that will be ruled on earth too. And just to kind of think, you know, hey, we got the statute here that's representing uh, empires, is that mountain language is also representative of empires or kingdoms as well in the Old Testament. Uh, Obadiah 1.21 says, And Savior shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. There you can see, you know, mountain language is synonymous with kingdom language. And so then when we read in things like Micah 4.1, but in the last days it shall come to pass, that should sound familiar, that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills and the people that shall flow unto it. So when you kind of think, you know, mountains is synonymous with kingdom language, and the context here is what, is what is really being said by Micah about God's kingdom being exalted above. It's stronger, it's highly, it's above them all, it's going to rule them all. Um, you know, we don't have to think that, oh gosh, we're going to have to hike up, you know, something above Everest peak or anything here. It's, it's you know, it's a metaphor saying that it's going to rule over top of all of them. Isaiah 2, 1 through 4 should sound familiar. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all the nations shall flow unto it. And many people will, shall go and say, Come you, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he, God, will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And God shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So the promise here is that one day there's going to be what? Peace. peace. World peace. When God establishes his everlasting kingdom on earth and is directly ruling it. So the other main question that we had was, who are the other three empires? And just to see what, you know, a little survey of the church, anyone want to take a stab at who the next three are? Faith? Okay. Brass. Okay. Anyone else? Two, three, four? Okay. Well, 
It's simple in a way because all we have to do is ask, or ask one question. Who conquered who? Starting with, who conquered the Babylonians? Okay, and their specific ruler was? Cyrus the Great in 539 BC, which then makes the Second Empire the Persian Empire. And who conquered the Persians? Greece did, under? Alexander in 332 BC. So the Third Empire is? Greek. Greek. Now, some might, you know, kind of split hairs over this and say, well, Alexander was really a Macedon, you know, Macedonian and not, you know, from Greece itself. And, well, that's, you know, just kind of, again, like I said, splitting hairs. Um, if you read chapter 8, you know, there's the goat and the ram, and they're going against each other, and the, ram, the, the he goat is specifically called Greece. And there's a notable horn on the, on the goat, and it says it's going to trample down and, and conquer all very swiftly and so forth is that there's not much debate there about who the notable for it is, that it is Alexander the Great. And so, always nice you can get a little history lesson in during church. So, who conquered the Greeks? Romans. Romans did. You could kind of play around with, you know, dates and so forth here. You could say that um, kind of, you know, 63 B.C. with Pompey's uh, uh, annexation of the Seleucid Empire, which was kind of like the strongest one of the four sub-kingdoms. Um, some might have on their chart 27 BC, because that's when uh, Emperor Augustus became uh, officially emperor uh, in, the, in, a, in Rome. Uh, regardless, is that the history records show quite conclusively that Rome was the one who conquered all four Greek sub-kingdoms. Um, the quick history lesson here is that when Alexander died, uh, there was no clear successor to him. Um, there's no like, hey, here's your son. He's up next, and we'll wait, wait till he gets a little bit older. Uh, he did have a son, which is probably not something most know, but he was like an infant. Uh, if, if you get into uh, uh, one of my uh, lessons on Chapter 9 with the 70 Weeks is that I dive hard into that. It's just kind of in, some intriguing history there. Uh, but Rome was the one who conquered all four of these kingdoms after Alexander uh, died. They split the, the empire into four, into four territories. Uh, their love for one another lasted about two weeks, and then it stern, turned into a bunch of civil wars uh, for a few centuries. And then eventually with the rise of Rome, they started to uh, conquer them or take authority over them. And so just a uh, little more history here, but, you know, we see Pergamum as one of them, which we get brought up, you know, in uh, Revelation 2. But this isn't the only historical way to kind of look at this and say that Rome is the fourth one uh, because the other well, one that we can go off of is the specific details that Daniel gave us. And he said that this empire would be divided. And this is exactly what happened to Rome. In 285 uh, AD, Diocletian, Emperor Diocletian, divided the empire into an east-west split. Um, there were still two ruling emperors. Uh, they just kind of felt like, hey, it's getting too hard to kind of run this whole show by, by only one guy. Uh, this kind of became known as the Tetrarchy period. Uh, but it was still one empire uh, together. But after a century where they just started to have civil wars with each other, uh, Constantine kind of brought them together for a little bit. Then his kids screwed it all up again, and they kind of tried to get back to paganism, and that failed. And then uh, with the rise of kind of the, with Christianity in the empire, is that Emperor Theodosius I in 395, and he's a Christian, uh, officially split the empire uh, finally into two, and with the Roman in the west and then the Byzantine in the east. Um, at this point, you know, if you're in high school world history or whatnot, you probably get to this point, and then your attention turns very much uh, towards everything about the Western history, uh, just because, well, we're in the West, and, you know, we like to just focus on ourselves. Um, but the Byzantine Empire actually lasted much, much longer uh, than the Western Roman did. Uh, critics, though, uh, there's always going to be objectors to uh, any view that's out there. Uh, this is the one I do hold, and I've kind of been uh, different places before. Uh, critics will want to say that Greece is the fourth empire uh, because they don't want to allow for supernatural predictive prophecy to be a, a real thing. Uh, let's get rid of God in this equation. So the way they look at Daniel is, let's move Greece down, 
And we're going to say that Daniel was actually written in the mid-second century BC, and that all these so-called prophecies are just written after the fact. They just portray it that way. Um, and it is authorship of Daniel is probably the most hotly debated of, of all uh, authorship in, in the Old Testament and probably all of the Bible. Uh, I do have a Daniel series on this, and this is where I drill down uh, harder than anywhere. Uh, prophecy is secondary in that study. Uh, but basically it's like, hey, if there is supernatural predictive prophecy, if Daniel, you know, did do this in, you know, 600 BC-ish time frame, um, and he forecast 800 years of history or 1,000, you know, up to the division of Rome, well, that can only be explained by what? There's a God who can oversee and knows all history before it even takes place. And that's the rational endpoint, and therefore we can't have that. Let's get rid of that. Let's put Greece there. And what they do is take Persia down to three, and they say the Medes are second. They try to say the Medes and Persians are dis, uh, distinct from one another. Uh, no. Uh, even the book of Daniel puts them together, and including that everyone knows historically that Cyrus, the Persian, conquered the Babylonians. Um, no debate on there. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, you got the, um, I would say, the so-called prophecy experts who, you know, hey, the more radical your view is or whatever, well, you're going to sell more books, DVDs, and all that, mm -hmm. I, I would say. Um, and so some of them will say, yeah, it probably not so much of a, you know, money avenue. Some will say mm -hmm. that it's, uh, like the fourth is Islam. That's, a, that's one that gets uh, put out there. And there's reasons because, you know, the history with Rome, and maybe we can tackle it a little bit more, is like, but where's, how does this continue on? exactly with you know the both legs and so forth and then they see the rise of islam kind of overtaking the byzantine with the ottoman empire and things like that um, that's one view uh, some will say china um, just because they see the rise you know try to make it very contemporary right now or even america as the fourth beast um, and so it just you'll see it all over the you know if you really just spend too much time on youtube uh, so uh, so I want to solidify why, and we'll say in chapter 2, that Rome is definitely uh, the fourth empire. And that's what I'm going to say is with the three J's, um, Josephus, John, and Jesus. Okay? The first with uh, Josephus, and if, if you don't know who he is, he, was a, uh, he is now a famous Jewish uh, historian that wrote in the first century AD. Uh, he wrote for the Roman Empire, uh, kind of gave him the backdrop to, you know, hey, this is Jewish history. Uh, very hard dive into the 70 AD destruction uh, with the wars of the Jews. But in his antiquities books, uh, he, he wrote, And indeed it so came to pass that our nation, Jewish nation, suffered these things under Antiochus Epiphanes. He was the uh, mid-century century, century uh, uh, Greek uh, ruler. According to Daniel's vision, and what he wrote many years before they came to pass, in the very same manner, Daniel also wrote concerning the Roman government and that our country should be made desolate by them. So Josephus, from you know, a secular Jewish pr perspective, definitely sees Rome as the fourth empire. And with that, is, you know, the, the main one that he was talking about was the city and the temple being destroyed in 70 AD. His reference to Daniel's prediction of this event is talking about Daniel 9.26 from the 70 weeks prophecy that says that the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Historically, the people who did this who were who? Rome, under Titus. I mean, you, there's just no debating that. So it's evident from Josephus and using this one, uh, especially just, Dan you could use Daniel alone, is who destroyed him. Rome did, okay? Next up is John. When he wrote his Apocalypse, Revelation, and he was on Patmos, who exiled him there? Rome did. And then in chapter 17, when we get there, is that he says that five had fallen, one is, one is currently here, and one has not yet come. Who would be the one that presently is at that time? Rome. Regardless, even if you said this was about emperors, is that it's still Rome in that in that respect. 
And then finally, his use with Daniel is that uh, with all these allusions and pulling from Daniel 2.7 uh, and 10 through 12, is that, you know, at the beginning of the book, we talked about how he says things that will shortly come to pass at the beginning and end, is that in both lines, he's using uh, the same Greek uh, phrases. And this pulling from Daniel 2, 28, 29, and 45 is that there too, he's usually using the same similar wording that is found in the Septuagint. Uh, the difference here is that Daniel spoke about far off future events, whereas John was speaking about these things are shortly coming to pass that Daniel predicted, or predicted. And so we see the same in uh, 229, and then 224, he or 245, he does the same, thus making Rome the fourth empire as well. And so in our last um, time up here, we talked about the last, uh, last days and that there too it would be uh, connected with Rome as well. And then our final J is with Jesus, and he says in two, uh, Luke 20, 17, But Jesus looked straight at the chief priests and elders and said, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls in the stone will be broken to pieces, and the one on whom it falls will be crushed. Most all see that Jesus is alluding to Daniel's, Daniel 2's stone, and thus making himself be that stone, that uncut stone. And so with that is that I would say that it's quite obvious that Rome is the fourth empire. Um, you can track the history, you know, going down there and, you know, get in that whole debate about when did it actually fall? Um, well, it just depends on how you try to frame it, but it kind of did continue on in, in its own little way. Um, and so, yes, uh, with the kingdom of God, our last question here is that, you know, what is it exactly? Is that sometimes when you go through the New Testament is that you're going to come across verses that speak as if it's like present. You know, Jesus says that, hey, it's, uh, it's currently at hand. It, it's come upon you. It's in your midst. And, you know, kind of that, oh, it was done back there. But at the same time, he still says it's a future thing, something that we're going to inherit, that it's going to come one day, um, and that, you know, his is not of this world when he was talking uh, to Pilate. And so with all that is that um, what scholars call this is a already but not yet uh, reality. Uh, this isn't a contradiction. It's just something like, hey, the kingdom of God has, is kind of here. We're already the citizens. Um, but yet there's still this future day where that full consummation, that full reality of it being on earth will be uh, done. Uh, this isn't as good as it gets, is the way I'll say it. Um, and finally, you know, with this uh, is that Jesus says that to us, come, you are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And that the kingdom is still something that is to be uh, ushered in. Uh, the fourth empire's destruction is not something that is done. Uh, how do you exactly track on all that? I'm, I'm still kind of, yeah, I don't know exactly, but probably because it's still a future event. Uh, it's, it's easy to look back <laughs> and say, you know, everything in 2020 hindsight, but when it's future, it's kind of, it's still blurry, you know, you just don't know for sure. Um, so I hope, you know, within this lesson is that it's kind of brought some clarity, uh, maybe still kind of questioning a little bit, that's fine. Um, but hopefully these first two questions uh, are answered by Daniel 2. And next week, we'll take a harder dive at Daniel 7, uh, who that little horn figure is in that scene. Reminder, hit the subscribe button below, turn on the notification bell, hit the like button, and leave a comment. And don't forget to visit us at justscripty.org. But in the meantime, stay salty.